Welcome to the webinar, How AI and Data Science Are Shifting the Face of SEO. This episode is part of OnCrawl's SEO Space Lab webinar series. You can ask questions at any time using the question section and we'll answer them at the end. I'm Rebecca Brobell, uh, Content Manager at OnCrawl, an award-winning technical SEO data platform. I'd like to give a warm welcome to all of our guests. Um, we have Nagib Toirini, Mike King, Christine Schachtinger, and Hamlet Batista here. Um, Nagib is an oh, is uh, an expert in SEO with over ten years of experience optimizing online brand visibility. He's helped top Middle East brands in various sectors, including Qatar Airways, Imar, Jumeirah Group, and he's currently global SEO lead at Artifact. Is there anything you wanted to add to that, Nagib? Um, first of all, thank you very much for having me today, and I'm very glad to be with uh, with both experts that I respect a lot. So thank you very much again, and very excited for this uh, webinar. Um, thanks. Mike King is a top SEO and sought-after speaker, which we can confirm. His roots are in computer science and music, balancing his creative and professional lives. He's a veteran of multinational agencies like Publicis Modern, Modem and Razorfish, and he founded iPull Rank, a digital marketing agency in New York, and often writes for major SEO blogs. He shares on his Twitter great tips about JavaScript, blog analysis, and other hot technical SEO topics. How's COVID nice. life treating you? It's fantastic. Can I use that as my bio moving forward? That was great. <laughs> <laughs> sure, if you want. Um, Christine, welcome. Over the past two decades, you've helped design, code, or implement sites for pretty much everyone from SMBs to Reba McIntyre, AOL, superpages.com, and USA.gov. As part of all of that experience, you've also worked on website visibility and SEO. You're the CEO and founder of Sites Without Walls, a full-service concierge SEO digital marketing consulting agency. And we can hear you at different industry conferences around the world or read your work in columns in a really impressive host of SEO publications. How are you doing today? Good, thanks for having me, I really appreciate it. Good, I'm glad you're here. Yeah. Um, and finally, Hamlet. Uh, you're the founder and CEO of the Agile SEO platform RankSense, um, which we heard great things about in our previous webinar uh, from Aleda Solis. Uh, your mission with RankSense is to accelerate SEO results to six weeks using artificial intelligence and automation. Uh, you've also served as the t technical review editor for the first and second editions of the book, The Art of SEO, which I think dates a little bit now. But more recently, you've published a bunch of extremely educational articles on using Python and data science in publications like Search Engine Journal. And we've heard you speak at a variety of conferences. How are you doing today? I'm awesome. Excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Great. I'm glad we're all here. And so today we're talking about how AI and data science are, let's see, are um, shifting the face of SEO today. And I'm not seeing... I'm here, you're not seeing... Yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure if we're able to uh, uh, see everybody's webcam, which I think is a little weird. Uh, let me just check right. on that. I know we can see each other. Um, okay, cool. Can... Oh. Um, so our first question is, do you currently use AI in your everyday SEO work? So yeah, I'll take that and I, I'll say that I use it not just in my day, in my day-to-day -day work, but I also uh, write a lot about it to try to encourage people to, uh, uh, SEOs in the community to take advantage of it. It's really exciting what's happening. Okay. Yeah, I can jump in there. So absolutely. Um, I mean, I do want to make the distinction between AI and, and machine learning. I think a lot of what we are doing is more using machine learning. Um, 
but yeah, we use it in a variety of different applications. So as an example, if you want to do um, alt tags at scale using computer vision, that's a good opportunity. Um, and doing things like keyword research and uh, you know mapping keywords to different stages and user journeys, we use it for that. Um, and then a, a variety of different data analysis projects. You know, when we do personas these days, it's more like cluster modeling at this point. Um, so there's a variety of different, you know, models that we use for these different projects. And it's something that our team is doing every single day. It's not just like, oh, let's, let's have an AI day or something like that. It's just like built into a lot of the stuff that we're doing. And then the reality of it is that Google shifted to be a machine learning company like what four years ago at this point so pretty much every application or product that google has does have some sort of ml component to it so whether we think about it or we're not i think we're all using machine learning at some point in the world. yeah and i would like to add to that that you might be even using it without realizing it if you're using google docs or Gmail, and you're and you're accepting the suggestions, the writing suggestions from Google Docs or or Word. You're already using AI, you know, in your work, in your writing, and you're not even realizing it. It's it's, you know, AI five years ago it was like the cutting edge, but right now it's it's like the internet. It's 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 common thing that is is you have it's part of your work, whether you even realize it or not. You're already using it, right? Even when you're creating presentations and you get suggestions in PowerPoint or, or Google Slides or, or in analytics, when analytics is making suggestions, you're doing uh, by asking questions directly on the, on the interface. So it's pretty much already common, common work, even if you don't realize it, right? Is that something you'd agree with, Nagib? Yeah, definitely. Actually, just uh, to give a bit of background about uh, Artifact, I actually realized I joined Artifact a year ago. Uh, Artifact is kind of like a, a hybrid model of consultancy. It's actually bringing together consultancy and traditional consultancy companies with like digital performance. And we are very proud actually to have like 30% of our staff who are like data scientists. So when I joined Artifact, I had to speak their language. I had to bring my uh, knowledge of SEO and deal with uh, data scientists. So, so for the last few months, actually, we've developed a lot of like use cases uh, using like SEO. So you have mentioned a few of them, but I would say content summarization will be one of the first use. Uh, content validation as well using BERT, and I'm sure we're gonna have like so many opportunities to talk about that. I think that's the two use cases where we actually now use uh, AI into our methodologies. Is there another use of AI or data science that you find you use daily, Christine? Oh, me? <laughs> yeah, I'm not, uh, just to clarify, I, everyone here has agencies, I'm just a consultant, so I don't have a team of people doing AI for me or anything of that nature. If it exists in the tools, of course I use it. Uh, but I think more my work with AI and machine learning is researching it and understanding it so I can, uh, explain it to clients or use it in presentations. Um, I've done four presentations on natural language and Google. Uh, so it's more on an academic basis that I, I go into the Google research uh, core and read all their research on documentation on AI and natural language to make sure I'm not misapplying its use in uh, my work with clients and also making sure I understand how it is used with my working clients, like neural matching versus rank brain or different things. Um, versus ranking factors, which are not. So, uh, okay. If five years ago you'd heard yourself say that, would you have thought you had to do this much research on AI? No, I did, my, I did my first presentation on AI uh, and machine learning with Google about two years ago, and I read over 80 documents, academic documents on <laughs> natural language processing, uh, you know, vector analysis, um, how all these things uh, Google's doing, uh, trying to achieve natural language, pure natural language interpretation. Uh, so no, I never thought as a sociologist and SEO that I would be spending the month on reading all this documentation on uh, machine learning and AI. For other people who've been more involved in 
producing AI or creating AI is, are you surprised to see how much AI has been present in SEO over the past five years? I'm not surprised, um, you know, because machine learning has been, been around for forever, right? So I remember back in 2012, um, a gentleman I used to work with, we we're trying to solve a problem. He was like, oh, you should just do machine learning for it. And I was like, all right, but that takes so long. You know, because you got to do all the feature engineering and all that. And there weren't as many uh, data sets that were as relevant to what we do now available. So, like, it was you had to do the feature in engineering yourself. And then it would be a, a bunch of, like, you know, trying a bunch of different algorithms. And there just weren't as many commonplace tools to do it as easy as it is. But once all those things popped up, you know, like your NIMES and your Lucky Earth, in your orange and all those other things like the the drag and drop visual tools that support uh, machine learning, uh, different um, pipelines and such, it just made everything easier. And then also uh, Python has matured dramatically, R has matured dramatically. So all these different things that make it easier. And then you've also got libraries for, you know, like JavaScript, if you really want to do it, um you can so things just got significantly easier over the last five years so i wouldn't be surprised to hear myself say like oh yeah you're finally doing it <laughs> actually yep. if i can jump on that i would say it's funny that you chose like five years ago because that was the tipping point for for us when it comes to machine learning even though google has been using like machine learning and, and, and ai we didn't realize or at least they never really communicated that straightforward and five years ago was the very beginning of a rank brain when it actually like starting to wash our brain and was starting to question oh our checklist is probably outdated we need to think about like beyond those keywords and those titles all those kind of things so we need to understand the machine and this is i think where we started to shake and be, be a bit i mean we were a bit afraid as well because this was like kind of like another type of an update before it was the penguin and those the panda it was just okay if you are doing rubbish seo then you're going to be basically penalized but this we had to rethink our methodologies and i think five years ago was exactly the the start of the starting of, of it and the big thing of this change was basically the fact that we, we i mean we've been told for years and years that the content was the king uh, no offense with the content but realized that the context actually was above that and was the emperor or if i want to make it more like arab local i would say the context is the sheikh so <laughs> to the middle east style <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so the context and connecting the words, and I'm pretty sure that Amlet can take um, so much more about that. Yeah, no, I'm I'm personally really impressed, and I I I am the opposite. I, I I didn't expect us to be the how far we are now than we were five years ago. And I will give you a little bit of context. So I'm I'm working on a deck for a, a presentation. I'll be doing a search engine journal uh, starting next month. So I'm going to be working on, on content generation, quality content generation. And just what I'm working on, the research and the progress, I'm just, I, I, I type the comments and I see that what the outcome, and I can believe my, what I'm seeing myself. I'm the one drive, driving it, and I can believe that a machine can write quality content with those instructions that you wouldn't even think, you know, I, I was trying to do that five years ago, and I was say. A machine can write that. A machine can actually write a coherent piece of content that is factually correct and that actually sounds like it was a human that wrote it. Absolutely. I wouldn't, you know, in a million years, I didn't think we would be that far. So, yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly impressed with how and how fast we're progressing. We're progressing at an exponential rate. And yeah. I agree with that because, you know, at, at Tech SEO Bruce, like, was it two years ago, I was talking about how natural language generation was going to be the next thing, but it's going to be like five years away. And literally, you, like, I saw some work you were doing like last year with the control library, and I was just like completely yeah. blown away at like how easy it is to generate viable content at this point. Yeah, and even but even Mike, you look at the control library, and it was it was a lot of factually incorrect, right? So it's mm -hmm. very impressive, but it made up a lot of stuff, right? But now you're yeah. seeing that the the actual the content is actually factually correct, and yeah. for me, it was like I didn't even think that they would get that fast so so quickly. Obviously, mm -hmm. 
I'm working on research that is just a, a couple of weeks or three weeks old, right? So, but even stuff that you know we're talking about the control library that's from from Salesforce from last that was November, right? Yeah. We're talking about five less than six months, right? And incredible. It's in, it's incredible what you're seeing right now. And the other part that is also incredible, you know, Rebecca, if you think about five years ago, it's not just what is possible, but how open it is and accessible. So this is not hidden in a, in a, in a data center in IBM or Google that you have to get, you know, you have to, you know, give, give, give up your son to get the key to get access to it. <laughs> this is something that you and me, right? You can go online and, and start, and you get access not just to the technology, but to the resources as well. Because the stuff that I'm preparing for this presentation is using a free TPU, you know, call app that anybody can access and anybody can use. And not only that you can access to that, it's all obviously super complicated, but also the knowledge, the, the, the education that you need to be able to use this is also freely available or incredibly accessible. That you just need to have the curiosity right to learn it and i'm seeing you know the people that we're hiring people just are still in school doing super impressive work you're not talking about you know million dollar researchers that are the, the only people that are doing this stuff it's just mind-boggling and just to just to add to that on the free tools just real quick um google does yeah. offer a crash course in machine learning and using tensorflow which is part of their pack uh, for anybody who wants to use it, so. Yeah, but all of them do as well. Microsoft does, Amazon, it's, it's just, it's absolutely available for anybody. It's all over the place, right? And the I other think, thing, you know, sorry that I'm, I'm a, little, a little bit monopolizing because they get excited about this stuff, right? It's, no, I think we're all excited. That's why we all want to talk about it. Yeah, it's just that you think about, you know, that right now, all this uh, Google, Facebook, they're paying researchers over a million dollars a year. The top researchers to work on work on technology on, on, on technology that they are releasing for free for people to use. Not just releasing the technology, they're releasing the code as well, right? It's, it, you you think about it, and you say, why is this happening, right? It's just you, you think about companies spending billions of dollars and they are competing against each other to who comes up first. You have this core, you have these scoreboards. So every, everybody's pushing each other, spending billions, the top researchers across the world, building on top of the other work. And you can see how that is progressing so fast. It's so fascinating. Yeah, Google actually has a section of the site that talks about why they invest in open source technology in this way. Basically what they say is that they can only get so far with their internal staff, but if they prop up open source, everything's gonna scale beyond what they could ever do internally. And then they bring that stuff back in this continuous cycle and they can continue progressing in that exponential way. So I think it's like you're saying, Hamlet, is that type of support like, um, you know, these big, the big three acting as like the benefactors for the development community. And then, you know, them, and then that also matched with like the growth of computing power you know, like we're like Moore's law is dead at this point, right? Like we are so beyond that that yeah. um, you know, like the things that we can, do, the things we will be able to do in our lifetime on the back of this technology is just completely mind blowing, and we're just seeing the beginnings of it. Like imagine uh -huh. twenty fifty, what we're gonna see. Exactly. No, that's what I tell you. And, and Mike, I tell you that, and, and Rebecca, right? So Rebecca, we we sell software. We you know we are in the in the in the in the in the, in the intellectual property business right and for me it was a big decision to start sharing code and private information i'm writing code and sharing secrets stuff like that and that's exactly the, the realization that mike said that i had when i was involved in the ai community and said look you know it's far you know what i can accomplish if i share what i know if i share the code and i start teaching the community all this cool stuff and what comes back and what we build together it's going to be far greater than my i mean we're going to be able to improve by myself just keeping what we know internally, right? Same realization because it's, and, and you're seeing it happening. You know, you've seen all these people writing, you know, across the community, taking Python and making the community, you know, stronger by all the stuff that they're sharing, coming up with ideas that I wouldn't think myself or my team, you know, and or, or, or uh, 
focusing on areas that internally SEO vendors wouldn't focus on. We're trying to address problems that don't make sense for an SEO tool vendor to develop because there's not enough people to address it, right? But, but the individuals doing that with the tools and the, and the capabilities, they can do that. I'm, I'm excited to see you guys, the data labs that you put together, yeah. encouraging that so that more people in the community get access to these tools and extend the capabilities of the platforms, right? It's really exciting. Right. And that's part of what we wanted to push with the data labs, because even internally, we have a lot of ideas that we can't develop fully to sure. their natural sellable endpoint, but that doesn't mean that they're not useful and that somebody else can't take that and build it into something that we really want to share. Yeah. Um, one of the next questions sort of builds on all of this, is we're talking here about search technology and what search engines use or what people who have the ability to develop use. Does that influence the technology that we need or that we need to use for SEO? I think it should. I don't think it does enough. And, you know, just the sheer fact that that people like Hamlet and, and I and everyone else, like the J.R. Oaks of the world and so on, have to, like, create their own stuff to get the insights that some tools just won't give you. I, I've always felt like that is like wrong. You know, I, I appreciate the fact that people have popped up and they do have these good ideas and so on and so forth. But there are so many basic things that I think that most tools should do that they don't do. And it's kind of frustrating when you have to like export all the data that the tool collected and then transform it further because it doesn't do that. And to that end, I think that there's also some instances where Google is just so far ahead of the SEO community. And also there's some instances where they're not. But I think that, you know, in a lot of ways, our tools need to catch up to Google's capabilities. When you think about, just as an example, headless browsing, like why did it take us so long to add that to our tools when Google has had that capability since like, what, 06 or something? Um, but, you know, I think it's, it's also kind of like a give and take because uh, the tool companies have to give people what they can actually use or the things that uh, they say in, in mass that they want. But, you know, I, I wish there were more people out there that were being like, hey, I'm seeing that these people in our space are coming up with all these things. Why don't we reintegrate that into our tools? Um, so, yeah, that's how I feel about it. Yeah, and, and I think um, one, and I, I agree 100% with Mike, I think that a big part of the is the economic incentive for tools, right? If people are not that sophisticated, so they're happy with just look at that ranking reports and looking at, you know, and not looking at how things are shifting over, over time. So if your audience, if your buyers are not demanding more from you, are not demanding more sophistication, it's easy to be complacent and just off what, they, what, they're, what they're asking for and not take any risks, you know, bringing new stuff, you know, that might be challenging or might, might, might not be, you know, uh, sellable, right? But I think, you know, as a whole, right, and that's what I love the idea of this, you know, I'm, I'm preaching again, the Python movement is, the more people in our community are knowledgeable about what is possible and that what you're getting is not enough and that can be done even better or, 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 or there's stuff that can, you can, a lot of stuff you can leverage. It's gonna become a virtual cycle that more people are gonna be pushing, you know, it's gonna be pushing us tool vendors into building more and more and smarter capabilities. And and being, you know, it's gonna be hard to catch up with the search engines, obviously they're spending billions of dollars in research, but they're making it available, right? They're making it available and there's no excuse to tap into or build on top of the stuff that they're making it available into the, to the tools that we use all the time and, and, and get in the community to also understand, look, you know, this stuff you're doing manually can be done faster. And that's also part of the motivation in my writing. Hey, we're pushing everybody to not be complacent and, and always be building more more advanced and more useful stuff that is smarter and, and saves more time from people in the community. From a user or a uh, consultant perspective, Christine, do you find that some of the search technologies that you cited earlier, like um, neural matching, mean that you've had to update the tools and technologies that you use? Um, you know, or that not, you want to? <laughs> yeah, maybe that I want to. 
uh, for research, it'd be great to be able to define the pattern patterning that Google's using. Uh, however, these are all applied at the the sort order, uh, not the you know not in rankings. So I don't really have much control over how rank brain or neural matching is used, other than uh, possibly to use like um, in links as a tool that uh, you know Dixon Jones has developed, which uses entity. Uh, application in uh, a website and uses machine learning to help identify the best ones. I think that can be helpful uh, because entity matching is what they're, you know, they're using. They're using in the neural network and in rank brain, they're using their entity and knowledge graph. Uh, however, I don't have a particular need to develop a tool for that. I think um, other people are developing uh, good ones uh, with way more money than I have <laughs> to, to do that. So I think it's better I understand how all that works uh, so that when I see the tools, I know which is applicable and which doesn't really have a whole lot of meaning for me. So I think I come at it a, a bit of a different angle from other people here. Um, I, and also my background is more in research. So I love when an update comes out to be able to research the update and it would be great to have tools that could better do that, better under, you know, take lots of data instead of looking at like search visibility, um, maybe be able to pull back websites that had losses and try to analyze better what, what might be wrong with them, especially on the technical aspects, because a lot of like in the core updates, there's been a lot of mis, um, misconceptions. Uh, I've recovered f five sites from core updates and all of them have been severe technical issues that have been on the site for a really long time. And no idea why Google ignored them for so long, but suddenly applied them. So machine learning could be really helpful in discovering that kind of commonality uh, as, as opposed to surface commonalities where it's like, it dropped visibility wise, but when we assume it's content or this, because you can't look, core updates affect everything. And so you can't look at all the factors that are known. So if there was a tool that could better analyze at that level, I think it would be extremely helpful. I, I can't stress how much I agree with what you just said. You know, if you think about tools that are collecting rankings and, you know, projecting traffic and all these types of things on websites and such, I don't understand why that isn't an ongoing thing that they aren't like surfacing like programmatically saying like here's what we're seeing across you know this vertical here's what we're seeing across all sites here's what we're seeing with respect to those different alg algorithm updates i don't know why they don't offer that like you have you literally have all the data so why <laughs> is that not a product um but i don't want to i don't want to stop your question, Rebecca. So, oh, but. Oh, no, just one thing to add to that really quickly is something I have noticed. Core updates are basically query relevance and site quality. Um, site quality also being technical. If tools could better identify query shifting, so as Google tries to apply, um, you know, BERT in the processing phase, obviously not at the live phase, uh, but they've gotten much more specific. So I've seen sites lose traffic, not lose rankings, but they Google shifted their query to something more specific. So like one site had uh, a list of nightshade vegetables that brought them, um, had 1300 keywords around that term. And it was a 60% drop on their site related just to that being shifted to nightshade vegetable list. And that was it. So mm -hmm. if there were keyword tools that could better identify query shifts with traffic, um, projected traffic, I think that would be very helpful as well. But that's the thing, like you have all the data, those tools have all the data, they have all the inputs, they have all the outputs, right? And to your point, query shifts, yes, like we don't have, we don't have enough good tools that are saying like, okay, this, this query was, you know, informational, now it's navigational, whatever, whatever um, model you use. And if we had that, I think it would be, I don't want to say easy, but it would be um, academic for them to be able to determine what was the change or what were the possible changes so that you don't have to do all that analysis yourself. And that's what I mean, that the, the, the tools are like halfway there, you know what I mean? So why not go the rest of the way? Are there other areas of SEO, like we've been talking about uh, query shifting or data processing, where we need some of the most work to catch up with some of the trends today? I, if I can, if I can answer this one, uh, I would say it's, it's first of all it's impressive to see the way that uh, 
SEO uh, always have like to, to adapt. It's kind of like it reminds me the, the, the quote attributed to Darwin, which, which is that basically the, the species who will survive are not will survive who are not the strongest, but are the one who, who adapt. And it was always the case. It's been 20 years we are seeing that SEO will die, and it's still there. It's now actually Google start doing like trainings about SEO uh, during this period. So SEO is still here and still valuable. But I can answer Michael King about why. There are no product about that probably because it's not the cash code and this is not where most of the companies are making money let's be honest between us so the the, the thing is like the the seo community had to adapt and um, i i jump on what amlet was saying i would say to quote like more the american from the silicon valley that say it's all about knowledge flow before cash flow and we had to do a lot of like a lot of like training, a lot of like uh, sharing knowledge and what you're doing. I mean, it's fantastic to to help uh, spreading you. your knowledge and like the and basically giving the ability to the community to empower the community and be, be able to to basically use those languages. Obviously, Python is not a, a ranking factor, but if you have to adapt, so we need to make sure that we basically stay up to date on the, the latest trend. But Instead of being like reactive on all those updates, we need to think beyond. Uh, and the good thing is, Google actually uh, already published two years ago what will be the search for the next 20 years. So instead of like just focusing on like what is the May 4th update on all those kind of stuff, yes, we are losing traffic, but we need to think beyond that and what will be the search of tomorrow and how the technology that we have access today can help us make this search. Uh, available and of course we can talk about a lot of like technologies and stuff but we need to re to focus on the essential and the essential are the other users how can we help the users find the right information i think this is what we need to always keep in mind yeah yeah no absolutely and i think you know my opinion is one area that i think is a big one that we're still behind is and, and Mike wrote a, a fantastic article about it, which is about the difference between you know keyword research and intent research, right? Which we, we, I see more and more people writing about the importance of not just being looking at the individual keyword here or even the closer of keywords, but more looking at what is what what do people want when they're typing those keywords and how they can express that intent in hundreds of different ways. And having you know the technological ability to not just be thinking about you know individual keywords, we're more thinking about what is it that people want, right? what is it that they want, and what stage they are in their journey of what they're trying to accomplish, right? So I think that's one of the areas that is the farthest, you know, and in, in, in terms of the tooling as well. Yeah, it's, it's an obvious one. That for example, one talk I'll be giving this Saturday is about um, connecting that intent and finding the content formats that are missing. So a lot of times when you're doing keyword research, you're looking for content gaps or for the, this keyword, I don't have this content piece and you're looking at the full content. What are you looking at just at the, at the content that you're missing or that you want to fill the gap for that content, but that whether you're missing on a specific content format that could capture a rich result and when I did the research for that, I found, you know, for one of my clients, a lot of pages that could use videos that they didn't have them. And there was already demand for them and they didn't have them, right? So that kind of stuff, right, it's, 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 it's what I, one of the things that I said were really behind on that. I see a lot of opportunity. Um, I agree with all that. I mean, I don't agree with the idea that no one would pay for more direct insight of what happened to them with respect to the algorithm. I think ultimately that's what everyone wants out of this data. So if you know a tool told you like these are the five things that are wrong for your query space or your vertical, you would pay for that. Um, but I think that you know on a basic level, rankings don't make sense like the way that we measure rankings in general just doesn't make any sense it doesn't reflect the SERP and I'm really happy to see that more and more rank tracking softwares are, are starting to introduce a new model like uh, AWR announced a new uh, universal model the other day um, some of the other ones like you know I just heard through the back channel that they're also working on new models so I think that our measurement of performance and I know that we should be talking about more like what is the traffic doing once it gets to our site not just rankings 
But the reality of it is a lot of our clients measure us on rankings and the way that we measure rankings doesn't make any sense. So I think that's like a, a core thing that needs to be solved first. And then beyond that, um, we can start talking about these more like sophisticated things. And also to kind of elaborate on that from the diagnostic side, which I do primarily, I do monthly support, but I also do a lot of audits of late, a lot of content audit. I mean, a lot of core update audits. Um, keyword rankers show like query loss, but uh, like a keyword specific keyword or query level. When I go do a diagnostic on, on a core update, one of the first things I look at is um, query loss across the board. So maybe they lost on nightshade vegetables, but that also had 1300 terms around it, but only two of those terms were responsible for 60% of that traffic and they lost those two terms completely. So more detailed analysis on how the query combinations are affected because now we're not talking about specific keywords anymore we're talking about concepts entities so nightshade vegetables was responsible for 1300 query terms and 60 percent of their traffic but only two of those terms were responsible for 60 percent of that loss so uh something that more ties things together mm -hmm. um and then if i look at the queries and and there's not a loss that way a shift it also can indicate to me as a technical SEO of another problem. So one site lost on a key term for a supplement, which led me to find out that they lost 800 supplement terms. And those 800 supplement terms had 800 redirect loops on those pages. We fixed yeah. the redirect loops and the site all came back, right? So if you only looked at the keyword loss, you would have thought you might have a content issue, but because they lost on every supplement term, we were able to determine that those, why did those pages all lose and none of the others? Obviously that's not content. So then let's look deeper and found the redirect loops. So there is a way to use keyword terms more uh, if we were to advance that topic or query loss to advance that to where you can actually use it as a diagnostic. Um, one I found on another site was a porn site that was the main in the top five keywords, which led me to discover an open search box where they could add to the title and description and URL, and um, they were being spammed by 13 million Prussian, Russian porn links. But again, <laughs> and they had an XSS vulnerability, right? But that unusual key term, which people didn't know was a porn site, it was just letters, uh, showing up in their traffic, had there been a different type of way that we look at keywords, would have been a great indicator that they had a huge problem that they didn't know about. So I think it can be taken a step further than just rankings and then just query terms for traffic, but also it can be used as a diagnostic tool. So I hope I didn't go too wayward there, but I think AI would be really good, or machine learning would be really good for, to, for doing that. Could you each share one recent use of, of data science that impressed or surprised you? Didn't expect or took things further than you thought it could? Well, for me, I'll say the content generation is it's incredible, yeah. I share an article about title tags and meta description quality generation in a, in a search engine journal. A couple, I think it was a couple of months ago or a month ago. Yeah. And um, yeah, I thought that was impressive. You know, when I saw the latest work from Google and that I could use summarize the content uh, in an abstracted way and produce quality. But then I, I continued to pursue more, and I was like, wow, this is even more impressive to have uh, the computer. Uh, well, I can advance one of the techniques that I'm going to be discover, uh, discussing is called uh, closed book question and answering. So having the machine, you ask him a random question. And it's interesting because uh, they, they had this trivia contest be between the machine and the research group. And the machine beat the researchers. So they got the questions right 30, over 30% 30 of the time. The researchers got it over 20% of the time, they got random questions right and trivia questions without the machine having the context of the answer and being able to answer it. Absolutely incredible. Yeah. And, and are we talking about how to use that to generate content? So it's very, very, very cool stuff. Yeah. Um, I mean, more like related to things that we are putting into the wild. I think the ability to analyze content and effectively um, reverse engineer the components that 
uh, Google cares about in a given query space is like magic. You know, you like run LDA and then identify topics and all our other stuff and then, you know, just make updates to your content and push it live and then you see it jump like 30 positions overnight. It's just magic to me. And I, I can't say enough about it. You know, that's like been one of the best things that we've been using over the last three years. So, like <laughs> I, I would say the same. I mean, there is so many usage of like AI from the learning, from the sensing, the planning. The, so there is so many examples beyond our methodologies. But when it comes to to SEO, uh, obviously the, the like the automation of the task, especially when you are working on a big scale websites, like automating sounds stupid, but automating like meta description, like ad tags for like a million pages websites, like it saves a lot of time, a lot of money. So this is one thing. But the other thing is more on the quality of the content. I mean, now we have AI can help us like confirm or deny human intuition and predict what will be the impact of the changes. This is never seen before. We were basically for the last few years, like creating content without necessarily involving the CEOs and just publishing and hoping that this will rank. Obviously, yeah. with the cosmetic, but that was more or less the thing. Now we have the ability to involve Google algorithm and especially BERT to validate the content before it goes online. And all the work that has been done recently for the last few months on NLP, is, it's amazing. I've seen so many case studies of people actually giving like a score, like a BERT score behind your content. Another example is basically you can copy paste a piece of content and ask the questions to Bert and see if he's able to answer this. This is fantastic. Yep. We are now we all saw those uh, those uh, slides and those presentation from Rand Fiske and about the traffic is going down. Now we need to move to answer engine and those algorithms can help us validate the content. So I think this is very practical uh, a use of like AI into our methodology and we should take advantage of it. We never had this opportunity before. So just to add on to that, because you mentioned the BERT score, um, I can't remember who, what the guy's name is, but he has a whole site of like, you know, Python SEO things that you can do. And he mentions how to compute the BERT score. So with the um, feature snippet update, we did some analysis where we compared the BERT score versus like other available metrics on the page. And it actually doesn't have a high correlation with, um, you know, you getting the featured snippet. So we actually found it was still the, the um, what was it, the page authority that had the higher, um, the higher uh, correlation. Um, so I, I think it's interesting because to your point, we do that as well. We'll say like, okay, let's write this page, let's optimize this page, and then see what, what uh, Bert might extract from this page. Um, but at the same time, it's not like, it's not the, automatic thing that you know you might assume it is because like if your page has a higher BERT score than another page you would expect that it would get the feature snippet and that's just not the case that's that's exactly the kind of debate that basically like leverage our knowledge and that's exactly mm -hmm. what we're like leveraging the knowledge to share because seo is not rocket science let's be honest between us what is the, basically the experience and like what Mike has experienced, like Amlet has experienced, what Christian has experienced, all bringing this knowledge together makes the value of our SEO. And to give him some credit, his name is Jean Christophe Schwinner, so we can give him some credit on that. Oh, yeah, his, his site is fantastic. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, will, I, will, I will tell you, I saw that code and, uh, and um, it's not really a BERT code, you know, he labeled it a BERT score. But it's it's more nuanced than that. I mean, BERT is a language model that you can fine tune with specific tasks. So what he did is he used a fine tune BERT specifically for question and answering, and then he took the context and he said, okay, based on the keyword and the content on the page, this is the score of that specific question against that content using BERT fine tune for question and answering. So mm -hmm. if you think about it, that new it's very nuanced. So it's not necessarily a BERT score. It's more of a query, question and answering whether how it ranks compared to, to uh, within the context, the the different answers in the content. How do they whether the content has the answer for that question? So I saw that and I said, you know, it's it is it makes for more interesting and and and, and for more interesting research. 
but for in terms of the accuracy, you know, I, I like to be a little bit more more transparent in that, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what yeah. I said. It's important that we have this feedback across the community because I still think it's welcome to do this kind of work. But I think for people that are not really knowledgeable on on this stuff, you know, they can be confused and think that oh, you know, a, a question and answering score is a birth score, which is not really the case. Okay. Right, and that's why we did that analysis because we wanted to see, like, you know, considering that nuance, what mm -hmm. type of, like, can we use this measure? And ultimately, uh, the analysis yeah. that we did indicated that we couldn't really believe in it. In that way. Exactly. And that's the reason. That, that's what I didn't even need to, you know, I didn't even try to do it because I could see immediately, no, this is not really a bird score. Mm -hmm. But it, I welcome still, it's good exercise, it's something that you want to be doing. But you still want to make sure that you are really being, you know, fully uh, uh, detailed on the nuances, so that people are not, oh yeah, that's that's a new score that we're gonna choose magic score, and that's not really. Yeah, and but, then it becomes the new domain authority. You know, people just exactly. like inherently believing in it. Exactly. That's that's what I did. Push it or retweet it or, or or because I'm very careful with what I stuff. I'm, I'm, you know, I have people that are following me, and then. I start, you know, praising stuff, but it's not precise. Then people start, you know, taking their own assumptions. You have to take also responsibility as you get more, uh, more visibility in the community and respect. Yeah, I think Agreed. that's that's very. Yeah, I agree 100% because BERT's a processing model, bi-directional processing model that enabled natural language to research to jump leaps and bounds because it can reduce the number of processors and resources necessary to process language. So it's not a, really a score that you could interpret. Mm. Um, it's predictive, but it doesn't mean that it would be applied at the, at the level of rankings and query, the pulling of the query, matching of the query um, at the search level. If I'm saying that, that can yeah, be let me, understood. Let me, <laughs> yeah, let me give you, you know, a heads, a heads up that, that uh, I'll have a, an article published in one of the search engine blogs that is going to be talking about question and answer. I'm just really excited about that one. They're talking about this specifically, and you're going to see the details and the nuances of question and answer in the BERT. So I'm really excited to see that. It sounds something. like I'm waiting for that. I'm definitely excited to see that. I yeah, yeah. track all your articles, Hamlet. Can't you um, hear his excitement? Yeah. <laughs> Um, it sounds like you all agree that one of the obstacles to increased use of data science and AI in SEO is knowledge, people's awareness of what they're seeing and what it means. Are there other or equally important obstacles to sort of the diffusion of data science in SEO? I think we just have to overcome the technophobia. Right, which is normal. It's normal for marketers to be technophobic about this coding, this Python, and this data science, you know, and, and all that stuff. And that's what I'm trying to put a lot of effort, right, in not just getting people excited about the applications, right, but more of all the ways that it can be super accessible and also how you can transfer what you already know in using Google Sheets or Data Studio or Regex or all that stuff, but you're already familiar and you're already using, and how that translates into putting the, foot, the first foot into this in this domain of you know AI, Python, you know data science, right? And and and, and the outcomes, right? And I and I think one one thing that's worked for me so far in my writing is showcasing people that didn't know anything about this stuff and now we're doing amazing stuff you know and i also like to do examples you know you see uh, ruth everett from the pearl that she was she didn't know any any of the past stuff she was scared about to try it and now she's writing and teaching about it she's amazing right and you know who yeah you know said so and and uh, a lot of really you know young people doing amazing work so and and that shows you that it's not just you know you know Mike Keen or, or, or Hamlet Batista or, or you know what I'm saying it's people that even young people that are just starting their career are able to take this off if they just, they just seem to be hungry and not be scared about it right yeah I actually really commend you for um, you know all the work that you've done and you know bringing people along. Because, you know, even, even from when I started speaking, I was like, yeah, everybody should code, everybody should code. And they're like, okay, bro, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? 
So it's really cool to see that a lot of people are um, getting on board. And like you said, we're, we're having this whole Python wave where, you know, a lot of people are just getting in and, and sharing things that they're doing. It's really, um, I think it's a really exciting time to be in SEO because of the fact that there are just so many opportunities to like invent new things. And there's such a good feedback loop from people that are doing that and very open to like helping you and so on and so forth. So props to you, props to everybody who's been doing that stuff over the last couple of years. Yeah, no, thank you. And it's been a community effort, right? So it's just, and I tell you, you know, when I started last year, I had like a couple hundred followers, you know, and I was like, how am I gonna even make a dent? Right. And if it was just about me, right, I wouldn't be anywhere. I wouldn't be, you know, and I I thought of that the whole community and showing them, look, you know, I need you to also share. I need you to be spreading the word. And it's been a, a, a collaborative effort, right? If you look at just two or three months ago, SEO Twitter was like, oh, no, you shouldn't be learning Python. Why learn Python? You haven't seen that. that. <laughs> right? You haven't seen that. We haven't seen people. Talking about, oh, you shouldn't be learning or whether you should be learning Python. People are not, no, 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 let's, where do I start? Where do I start? I don't know, man. I don't know who you follow. I still see people being like, oh, you don't need to know that. <laughs> I, I, I would say they're equally important to know, though, because data science is really a new reconception of statistics, right? It's modeling Agreed. larger data sets and using machine learning as an addition. As people understand what, how to actually apply the information. I've worked with several companies where they have a data scientist who knows nothing about SEO and goes, well, the p-value is this, so this must mean that. And you're mm -hmm. like, well, that p-value is probably just because you changed the page and people saw something new and interacted with it, like they're talking about a change to the UI or the UX. So I think people need to understand how statistics work and how proper interpretation and application of statistics work. As going through, I went through graduate school worked on my doctorate in sociology, so I've had multiple statistics methods and data analysis courses. So sometimes I see people come out with something and, and well, this value said this, so it must mean that. And it's like, well, you know, there's spurious correlations, correlations, not causation. So I think on top of learning how to code and, and pull the data, people also need a better layer of understanding on how to interpret the data and what is meaningful and what is not. Yeah. Dr. Christine, okay. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't get the PhD, but I did all but the dissertation. So I spent seven years in a doctoral program. I, I mean, get... you've written you've written enough blog posts. It's basically the dissertation. So you're Dr. Yeah. Christine. <laughs> From a personal perspective, I would definitely agree with what you just said, Christine. I grew up with computers around me. So when you say, "Oh yeah, you've got to look at Python now," I'll spend half a day figuring out how basically how the language works, and that. Personally, that doesn't bother me. But I found that um, without a background in analytics and statistics, that hinders me more than the technological aspect. Yeah, I agree. I, I think, and, and I just think it's just better for everybody because they'll better interpret the data. They'll better understand how to apply it and understand that maybe your value came back saying this is significant, but you know that it really isn't. And you know this because you knew how to put together a proper null hypothesis or a question. You knew how to properly apply the data. And you knew what else could be affecting the data result that you got outside just the input of numbers and output of numbers. We have a couple questions from the people watching. Um, the first is, where is the best place to start working with AI for SEO? This is from someone who's working with Python and Jupyter Notebooks at the moment but they feel like they don't know where to go next to grow their knowledge. <laughs> Read everything Hamlet writes. <laughs> <laughs> Better than Mike says that and I said, oh. <laughs> right. <laughs> the, the way I started to so, be honest yeah. with you, I started to follow Hamlet. So let's be honest. Uh, and I got lost. Uh, and I say, what is he talking about? I'm an SEO. <laughs> I don't understand anything. What is an MP? What are all those uh, vocabularies? I'm lost. So, so what I did personally, I said, I actually, I'm working with like, as I told you, like 30% of our employees are like data scientists. So I see like, like Python and all those languages are as they are languages. If I need to talk to my, uh, my co-workers and to work with them on like a common project, I need to speak their language. Otherwise, I, I mean, I just basically cannot like, fully unleash the potential of my of my work 
So I had to speak their language. So what personally I did, I, I follow like a course. I, uh, to be honest with you, I did a lot of research to identify what is the best course because today we are lucky enough during this uh, period that all the courses are almost free. I'm pretty sure we will need this period with having like a PhD. If you don't have the PhD after this COVID, you lost your life. So the thing is, I would say, personally, Data Camp was the best platform to start with. Uh, I don't have any shares there, but I really like it. Very, very handy, very practical, and with like great knowledge. And then, obviously, uh, people like Amlet like share like regularly articles, so you need to have like the hands-on. But as he said, like you need to overcome your fear, especially when you don't come from this background. It can be very scary. It can be very scary. But starting with like introduction and knowledge, that was my approach. Well, Rebecca said this person already has um, you know Python skills and so on. So it sounds like what they really need to do is develop the context, right? Like understanding, you know, what do these things mean in terms of SEO? So, um, you know, I think, again, you know, looking at some of the courses you, you just mentioned are great. Looking at what Hamlet has out there is great. Uh, there's other people in our space, you know, like um, Paul Shapiro, J.R. Oaks, also sharing things. Um, and I feel like we have a guide called Machine Learning for Marketers. So, again, if you already understand, you know, Python and such, reading this will give you more context as to, like, why this, like, what these variables mean when you're doing the different analyses. Um, and other than that, I mean, I think just staying abreast of the data that's available in our space and like, you know, spending the time in the data dictionaries that these different tools provide, like understanding what the metrics mean so that you're not developing spurious correlations, for instance. Like if you, if you do, a, um, you know, a regression model against something that's an output, of something else that's also an output, it doesn't necessarily make sense, right? So having an understanding of what the data means is the biggest component of it, so you can actually work with it. And also I'd say, um, not everybody is, pro I'm just gonna call it programmer brain, right? There are people for, for it makes no sense to them at programming, but that doesn't mean you can't utilize AI or the application of it by what Mike was just saying, what I was saying before is understanding how the models work, understanding how it can be applied. Um, people are going to build the tools. So if you don't have the ability to build the tool, that's okay. But understand how to formulate um, uh, a, a problem that you're trying to solve properly and how to use the statistical modeling or the data science to answer the questions that you're looking for so that you're not creating um, information that is not useful to you. I used to have a data scientist on one team who everything he told me he found was meaningless to SEO, like had no <laughs> no application. Exactly. He's like, well, this and this, and I'm like, but that would actually hurt us, help <laughs> us. So I, I think you can be equally as um, helpful to your team or to your clients to just understand how to apply what the tools will be pulling back for you and to under, better understand data modeling and how to construct a proper analysis. Just like Mike was saying, you can't use, or you can't use, um, regression analysis on two outputs, you also have to use the right variable type to do a regression analysis. One big SEO uh, years ago did a regression analysis on a variable type that can't be used for regression analysis. And what that basically means to anyone who has no idea what I'm talking about, uh, you, it's math. So you have to use the right kind of data for that kind of math. And if you don't, the result is meaningless. And so there's a lot of complexity on the side of just developing proper questions for the, the analysis tools to uh, help you answer. So you can hire the programmer to help you answer them. If Python, you look at Python and go, oh my gosh, I have no ability to do that, which is fine. You don't have to do Python to be an SEO. You just have to know how to apply the data that somebody can pull back using those tools. Yeah, and, and you'll be surprised, you know, that I agree 100% with, you know, what Christine just said is, the, the learning the language, you know, learning the programming language, it's going to take you, you know, less than a month, you know, it's going to take you a couple of weeks, you know, the syntax and practicing, that is not the most valuable part of the learning of the language, or even, you know, you can have a, you know, hire a developer to do that stuff. The hard, the, the, the biggest challenge and opportunity and the most valuable part is on learning to describe what you know in terms that can be translated into computer code or, or, or into a, a data analysis report. Because where I see the biggest opportunity is that you have a data scientist, like Christine said, 
doesn't have any context about SEO. And then you have the SEO that doesn't have any context about the computer science. So then you have these gaps where the questions can be asked because the data scientist iterating based on questions he's making up on his head, whether he doesn't have any context. And then the, the SEO doesn't even know how to ask the question. So whether, you know, whether those questions are possible. But when you know a little bit of both, you can translate your knowledge, your understanding into accurate questions to the, and even work in tandem with them so that you find really interesting insights. And if you look at the mistakes of the past in terms of the reports, because you know that we've made it a few times in terms of research reports that are being produced, it's because of that disconnect. Oh, here's all this data to a data scientist, come up with some SEO insights and they come back and they come back and tell you that structured data is useless for SEO rankings like we just saw recently, right? Which, you know, as an SEO, that doesn't make any sense, you know, because the results are rich. Most of the results are rich right now. You need structured data to make them resource rich. But if you're only looking at the temple links and you're excluding them, obviously you're going to come up with that conclusion. So that's where having somebody that, you know, people that can, can understand both ends Right, the SEO that understand, look, you know, it's not just the temple links, you have rich results, you know, like Bill Slasky was bidding on that report. And you have the data scientists, and they did an incredible work, they put a lot of effort, but they missed that having somebody with the expertise to input and say, no, you have to also include this in your analysis so that the conclusions make sense at the end, right? That and one... that is where, I'm sorry? And I was just going to add to that. Having, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Rebecca. Go ahead, go ahead Christine. I was just going to say that um, having an SEO that understands like how Google's using machine learning and AI back to our original concept is that Google doesn't do pure natural language processing. It has to have an interpreter. It's called an interpreter in um, natural language processing. The etymology of it. Um, so schema is the interpreter for natural language processing because they can't understand words like we do. They have to have us tell them what the words mean. So they know it's an article, they know it's a review, they know it's a... So if you knew that as an SEO, then you can help them interpret that. Sorry, that's my cat going behind me. He normally leaves me alone, but he's very interested right now. But anyway, so uh, the point just being, you have to have that, like you were saying, I'm like, somebody who has the ability to bridge the gaps between what the data might say, but also understanding why it's important uh, to have schema no matter what whether it comes up as a positive data point. Sorry, but I think <laughs> we're running out of time there, but we have a final question that is an, actually an interesting one. Is there a quick answer to how to figure out whether a supposed AI tool is stable or valid for SEO? Mm. No. <laughs> I mean, you, you have to like test it out. Like, there's no way to just look at it. Like, oh, this is stable. This is valid. You have to you, go through the process. Of... Way. No, there is a huh? simple way. You need you need a free trial. So make sure you try it for free. See if it works. <laughs> if it does, you know, you know, throw it out. Simple as that. You need a free. You, you need to be able to try for free. See, try it in a in a in a way that it's not going to have a negative impact on your site, and see if whatever is promising delivers in the timeline that is supposed to happen. And if it works, you you pay for it. Otherwise, you know, just, no, don't waste your money. Great, thank you very much. I had a great time. I hope you all got something to take away from this. You all shared very interesting elements. Um, thank you. So thank you very much for participating. Thanks for having. Our, our final SEO Space Lab episode will be on Thursday, so in two days. It'll be our closing keynote by Francois Goub on why startup culture can't live without technical SEO. If that sounds interesting. Make sure you sign up and tune in on, thir on Thursday. Um, and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank, Thank you, guys. Bye.